Open up your Bible, if you'd like to follow along, to the book of Jonah, chapter 3. <clears throat> Jonah, chapter 3. Our, our text will be the first four verses of that chapter, but I'd like to read the entire chapter. It's, it's relatively short. It will give up a, a broader context that we will refer to. So Jonah, chapter 3 beginning at verse 1. And the word of the Lord came unto Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. So Jonah arose and went unto Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceeding great city of three days' journey. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, and proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest of them, even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne, and he laid his robe from him, and covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes. And he caused it to be proclaimed and published through Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn every one from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hands. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger that we perish not? And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And God repented of the evil that he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Mm -hmm. Last time we considered Jonah, we looked at chapter 2 under the title of salvation is of the Lord. And certainly if there is a verse that would be the theme of the entire book, it would be that salvation is of the Lord. The mariner's salvation, the Ninevite's salvation, Jonah's salvation. Remember we, we talked about that salvation includes uh, experimental and spiritual and temporal aspects to it. And, and Jonah himself was going through the process of salvation that included all these other things. And when Jonah concluded that prayer, salvation is of the Lord, that was really the, the capstone when he came back with that understanding and, and that wisdom of God, as we'll look at today, where he realized what it was all about. Last time we looked at salvation was according to God's grace and mercy, God's timing, God's command and God's means. Again, we looked at the nature of salvation. It's temporal, spiritual, and experimental. We looked at the price of salvation. And here we saw that, that Jonah, as he was typifying the Lord Jesus Christ in the belly of the whale, our Lord who, who suffered and died and was laid in a tomb for three days. And we saw some of those, those verses from the Psalms specifically they gave us a window into the, to the mysterious and, and the deep transactions that were going on with the Son of Man. And someday I would like to return to that because I, I don't think I gave it enough justice. And maybe before we finish Jonah, we might return there. But, and then we concluded with salvation's result. Just as Jonah was spewed out from the belly of the whale, he, he was vomited out. He was resurrected from the dead. So the Christian is to walk in newness of life. Amen. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh thereof to fulfill its lusts. So now we come to chapter 3. And chapter 3 is, is just as fast-paced and as spiritually rich as the previous two chapters. I was talking to a couple of the, of the men last week about Jonah, and I, and I said, I feel like I have spiritual whiplash because... <laughs> So much is going on in Jonah, on every front, God dealing with Jonah, and, and Jonah doing all of his things. And then the Ninevites here waiting 
for this tremendous word of God that is going to come and, and do a miraculous thing. It's extremely fast paced and there's a lot here and, and we can't read, as you'll, I trust you'll see today, we can't just read this very quickly or in a shallow way and expect to, to glean God's message. So just by way of overview, chapter 3 is going to include elements and themes like, like Jonah's recommissioning and his obedience. Uh, Jonah's preaching God's word to a heathen nation. Think about the dynamic of a missionary going to enemies, different culture, and preaching God's, God's word. And, and all the one man to that, to that large city. We're going to t it's, it's going to talk about the nature of God's word and God's purposes, unchanging, regardless of what Jonah tries to get out of. Uh, the task that Jonah is doing, Jonah, any man, a hundred men, a thousand men, could not do that work apart from the power of God mm. residing in the midst of that situation. And God's purposes decreed from before time began. We're going to see faith and repentance. Faith and repentance. We're going to see man's works that God seems to take into account. We're going to see the government getting involved. You know, how often do we say the government gets into my life in areas where it shouldn't? But here's, there's a higher, there's a higher law, God's law. And here, the king, it's no small thing that the king gets off of his throne and humbles himself under God's, the preaching of God's word. So we're going to have, and then we're going to have this widespread awakening, revival. Uh, then God apparently changing his mind. A lot of stuff going on in chapter 3. Mm -hmm. So today we're just going to begin to look at these first four chapters. And if you follow your outline, we're going to look at a disciplined prophet, mm -hmm. a distinctive message. This distinctive message, we're not going to look at the specifics. I want to just note one thing about the message that Jonah is about to, to preach. A divine method, a determined ministry... I hope that phrase rings a bell, a determined ministry, and then a discriminating <coughs> preaching. And then we're going to get into, not again, not the specifics this week, but we're going to look at the, the vehicle of preaching. Uh, preaching is the envelope that, that carries the, the letter or the message in it. We want to just note something about the preaching, and this is going to really set the stage for this widespread revival, this widespread awakening. So first of all, a disciplined prophet. A disciplined prophet. We've seen from chapter 1 that Jonah seeks to flee from the presence of the Lord, from this missionary work that God has given to him. Jonah already had a successful spiritual ministry to King Jeroboam II. And now God is going to extend that call, and he calls him to be a missionary. And as you know, Jonah refuses and he runs away. To say that this work for Jonah would be difficult would be an understatement. Again, a thousand men could not do that in their own power. It's, it's going to be extremely difficult. And God is, is, is putting a tremendous demand upon Jonah, but he was not sending Jonah on a fool's errand. Jonah would not go to warfare at his own expense. God has something in his mind that he wants Jonah to, to participate in. And it seems like Jonah did not take that fully into, into his, his action, certainly. There was a divine purpose. There was, there was, Jonah did not misunderstand or mistake God's calling. Jonah knew what God wanted him to do. And so Jonah, as you know, undergoes this discipline. This discipline that I think is fearful extenuating this discipline that demonstrates not just the act of discipline you know when we spank our children because they just they they are misbehaving or, or young kids think about everything attached to the discipline of God that is exhibited as he's disciplining or chastening Jonah his sovereignty his omnipotence his wisdom his, his truth his purpose. He's disciplining Jonah in, in such of a such of a of a of, an, of a comprehensive 
way. And the discipline has, has two fronts to it. Remember, Jonah is failing God on two fronts. His personal walk and in his office as prophet. Mm -hmm. And so this, this discipline, this chastening that's going to come into him, it's going to have to deal with his personal fellowship, his personal relationship to God, and the fact that he has forfeited or he suspended his office as prophet. God, by his grace, restored him. And God restored him to his office. Very similar to Peter. Remember, Peter denied the Lord. And you recall, as, as Christ restores him back, he, he asks him three times, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love? Then feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. So, so he was restored to, to that office. But just because, just because Jonah was restored to his office, and obviously Jonah was a very peculiar, a very special case, does not mean by way of, by way of just a thought, people who fall in, in ministry today, people who are of notoriety, people who have a name, they're a televangelist, they're a radio person. Um, I think today, because that person is to be above reproach, I think we're living in a day with the internet where people under, find out something right away all over the world. I think by and large that person would not be restored to a public ministry. And I say that to emphasize that, that that Jonah as is a disciplined prophet. God is dealing with him in, in such of a special way that he is actually going to now, no excuse for his sin, he's going to be better prepared for this work than he would have been. He sinned, but he was forgiven. He suffered, but he was delivered. He prayed. And he got a tremendous answer. And as I recall, our pastor finishing two weeks ago that series on the hidden wisdom of God, I really believe Jonah, despite his, his, his blatant sin, I think God revealed to him that hidden wisdom of God. And, and we're going to see this snapshot now we're going to deal later with his, his chapter 4 issues. But we're going to see, see Jonah with this obedience and following through. And I believe understanding the heart of God where he did it. Deep calleth it to deep. The hidden wisdom of God is, is, was molded and super compressed into the prophet Jonah. And as we saw uh, during that series... God can take us through a variety of issues. It might be, it might be sin and rebellion. It might be a sickness. It might be, be being driven into the wilderness for purification. It, it might be a number of things where God would, would teach us that hidden wisdom. Again, even though later he would seem appear to, to fight against it. But everything that went into his life, this, this, this discipline, he understood, I think, a fresh and with a special impact, reverence for God. An understanding, not as an armchair theologian, understanding God's command to go to Nineveh. So far superseded his comforts, his desires, who he thought he was, what he wanted to do. He understood, understood gratitude to God for this great deliverance that he had. Mm -hmm. This affliction, I think, put a mark on him. He was subdued. He was chastened. I think it put a mark on him that he would never forget. Amen. Like, Jonah, uh, like Jacob, who wrestled with God, and God put his, joint, his, his thigh out of joint, and he lived for the rest of his life. And it was a divine wounding for God's glory and God's purposes in his life. I think Jonah had that type of, of, of an understanding and, and wisdom that God did in his life. He, he knew experimentally his, 
powerlessness and God's omnipotence. And as he said at the end of chapter 2, I am going to pay my vows to the Lord. As a disciplined prophet, he could speak about the terrors of the Lord, could he not? I think I said that if I was swallowed by a whale, I would immediately give up the ghost of my own accord because I, I can't imagine anything worse than that. He could speak about the terrors of the Lord. He could speak about the stupidity of trying to run away from God and, and the ignorance that caused him to do that, hoping to escape God. And I think his preaching would take on an edge, would take on a reality, and he could speak by experience. And as a matter of fact, someday when we get to Luke chapter 11, we'll see that Jonah himself became a sign to the Ninevites. Mm -hmm. So I think this disciplined prophet, as God has molded him, God has corrected him, God has has enabled him to get to the place where he would set his feet back on the king's highway to go to Nineveh, he would be better equipped to do this wonderful work. This does not justify his sin, does not justify his disobedience that required divine chastening, but he could tell the Ninevites what it's like to be in service and fellowship with God. I mean, he could, he could remember what he was like in, in serving Jeroboam II where his prophecies came to pass. And he was God's man in God's place. He could talk about the wonders and, and the blessings of that. He could talk about what it means to run away from God and to pay the fare thereof. He could talk about what it means to go down. Remember we saw five times the scripture says, he went down, he went down, he went down five times. He could talk about what happens when God brings storms into our life. And when you know God is behind that storm. He could talk about the vanity of false gods. He could talk about paying the ultimate price. He could talk about the condition and the place when the sovereign omnipotent God is dealing with you one on one. And that matchup is totally unequal. A man made of dust and a sovereign God. He could talk about coming out of the other side of discipline and the blessings of that. No chastening for, for the moment seems to be wonderful, or one, but, but grievous, but afterwards it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness, which is what God's after. Jonah, like us sometimes, we're not after that because it's too hard, it's too difficult. God has a higher purpose, a higher plan. Relative to the Ninevites, Jonah could speak, I think, about hope. If I was a Ninevite, and we did not talk about what, what the Ninevites did, how bad they were, the kind of stuff they did, but if the gospel came to me as a Ninevite, I think I would have the door of hope shut. Because I would realize that the grievous sins and evil and wickedness and violence that they did is unspeakable. But Jonah, Jonah was in a place where there was no hope as well. The door of hope for Jonah, I believe, was shut. And he could talk to them. He could say with, with Paul, with, with genuine um, pathos, he could say, men ought always to pray and not faint and not lose heart. Because I was delivered in a hopeless situation. He's a disciplined prophet. He's been disciplined by the Lord, and I think he is better equipped. And he will go to Nineveh, and he will be used by God to bring about this tremendous awakening, this tremendous revival. Secondly, a distinctive message. Jonah has a distinctive message. And I don't want to be specific. I want to make just one note about the message that he's going to bring. I asked you a bunch of questions. I think it was our first study. I asked a whole bunch of questions that we should have when we read through the book of Jonah. Because there's a lot of strange things if we take our time to not read it in a shallow way or quickly. There's a lot of things that, that should pop up to the surface. And one of the questions I asked you was, 
Why is the second commissioning of Jonah different than the first one? What's going on? What happened? Notice the difference in chapter 1 and verse 2. God says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it. For their wickedness has come up, from before, come up before me. And then notice chapter 3 and verse 2, which we read. Arise, go unto Nineveh, that great city, and preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. The first commissioning, cry against. The second commissioning, preach unto it the preaching that I will tell thee of. The Hebrew word for cry, chapter 1, is the same Hebrew word as the word preach. But the translators translated it as preach because of that second word that is attached to it. Preach the preaching that I will tell thee of. And again, notice that very little word that I think is very important. Instead of crying against it, preach unto it. Jonah has a message now that is different than what the first message was going to be. It's a different, it's the same call, but it's a different word that he's going to give. The first message is clearly that message of judgment against the city, where the second message, which is, by the way, going to result in large-scale faith and repentance, and the salvation of these Gentiles. So, so why would God do this? Why, why the difference? What happened? You have the answer right in front of us. What happened between the first call and the second call? We have the sign of Jonah. As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man would be in the heart of the earth. The first commission to Jonah was before the sign of the prophet Jonah, before the death and resurrection of Jonah. The second commission was after his experience in the belly of the whale, and the difference between judgment and mercy was Jonah's experience in the whale as a type, as a foreshadowing of the gospel of redemption mm -hmm. that Jesus Christ would bring about. Jonah as a type, as a picture of our Savior in his death, burial, and resurrection. Before the cross, it, it was largely a ministry of death that reigned. Retributive justice all, happening in real time very often. The principal part of the message after Calvary is good, glad tidings of great joy, mercy, life, and light. Between the age or the dispensation of law and grace, between the age of looking forward with some obscurity and looking backward with a more sure word of prophecy, between that time when divine justice would very often be meted out in real time and divine mercy plentifully shown and explained, between the time where the Old Testament, the age of law, and then there was just one nation, largely, that God was dealing with, and New Testament grace, and the Holy Spirit poured out, and every tribe, nation, country, and tongue, between Mount Sinai and Mount Zion stands Calvary's cross. Between Jonah's first message of judgment, cry against it, and the second message, preach unto it the preaching we have the sign of the prophet Jonah again as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly so shall the son of man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth we are not told specifically what Jonah's first message was it, it, its contents but very clearly it was against them there were threatenings and there were judgment the second call we have additional to the warnings. We have a probation period. We have the results of the message, which we know, faith and repentance and belief. 
an offer of salvation, and there's other consequences to his message that he preached. And though on the surface it looks like it still appears to be judgment against them, it's a message of grace. God gives the Ninevites a chance. He gives them 40 days to turn to the living God. And we know from the widespread faith and repentance that when Jesus said the Ninevites will rise with this generation and they will condemn it because they did repent and they did believe in God unlike that religious generation of our Lord's Day. Mm -hmm. I think the spiritual application for us today, dear friends, relative to, to, to perhaps an Old Testament mentality, uh, being macho to cry against the sinner who sins, just like you sinned before you were saved, we have a more sure word of prophecy. We've got the reality of the cross. We've got the reality of the gospel. We've got the reality of redemption. We could preach the law as a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And we could preach the cross of Christ, Christ as the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Jonas now has a very distinctive message that God's going to use in this revival. Thirdly, divine method. Divide method. Verse 2, preach unto it the preaching that I bid thee. Verse 3, Jonah arose, went according to the word of the Lord. So now Jonah's on his way to Nineveh. What's he going to say? How's he going to act? What's he going to do? God says, preach the preaching that I bid thee. And Jonah went, how? of his own volition, of his own imagination, picking up some traits of culture to, to combine with God's word so that it will be more palatable and friendly and easy. No, he went according to the word of the Lord. He's not going to make that mistake again. God's word is going to come to him with its plainness, with its reality, and he's going to go that way. God's going to use, obviously, the preaching of his word to bring about the desired results. It's going to be the proclamation of the word of God, the sword of the spirit, which is able to do what? It's only God's word that can pierce and divide between soul and spirit, joints and marrows, and can explode the thoughts and intents of our heart. God's word. It's the foolishness of preaching. Jonah knows that special presentation of God's word that cross cuts culture and time that God uses to save some. Jonah is not left to his own devices. Jonah follows the instructions. He goes by the word of the Lord and he's going to preach what God tells him to preach. This is the divine method. Jonah's going to take God's word in God's way. At God's time, he's going to do what God tells him to do. Not his words. God's word. And this, if you read through the scriptures, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Paul, uh, they speak and they even tell us that they are speaking what God told them to say. One, one verse from Moses. This is what Moses said talked about. And God is telling Moses, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren, like unto thee, Moses, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. Who is this man that God's going to raise up, that God has to put his word, words into his mouth, and that will speak everything that God commands him? Who's the prophet like unto Moses? It's the Lord Jesus Christ. Even Jesus Christ acknowledges that what he shares is from above. John 12, 49. Jesus says, I have not spoken of myself, although he could have, but the Father which sent me. He gave me a commandment, what I should say, do you see the Jonah parallel? And what I should speak, 
and I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. And so, why in some churches do we, do we bring in other stuff to <clears throat> distract us from the Word of God, to make the Word of God more entertaining, um, to, to adorn it with some trinkets that God never tells us to adorn it with? Now, to be sure, each preacher is going to have their style. They're going to have their different outlines. They're going to have different inflections. They have different experiences. But, but the sum and substance of the message is going to be, should be, the Word of God. Amen. In its simplicity. In its plainness. Not preached with men's wisdom, but, but in the unction of the Holy Spirit. It should run and be glorified because of it's God's Word going God's way. We don't try to trick people, cajole people into the kingdom of God. It's not our own theology, our sentiments, our notions. We don't preach science, politics, all that stuff. The pulpit is not either. The pulpit is not a place where a, a pastor tries to build up his reputation. I was talking to somebody this, this week, a former pastor, nobody that anybody here knows, and he was relating about his friend. And his friend's goal as a pastor was simply to climb the steps of the Southern Baptist Convention to get to some nirvana of SBC. Mm. And even this pastor friend thought, but what's this guy doing? You don't use, we use this for nothing other than to proclaim God's word. And Amen. we depend upon him. We do what he bids us according to the word of the Lord. And again, by way of application, how do you become a biblical husband? Or a biblical father? Or a biblical wife? An employee? Employer? How do you become a church member that is right in the sight of God? Jonah chapter two, uh, verse 2, what he bids us, verse 3, according to the word of the Lord. How do you order your days? How do you spend your time, your discretionary time? How do you discipline your children in the fear and nurture of the Lord? How do you relate to the world? Uh, what do you do with those skills, knowledge, and abilities that God has given you? What he bids us, according to the word of the Lord. What saith the scripture, Paul kept asking when a question would come up. Paul would point back to the scripture. What saith the scripture? It is our rule for faith and practice. It's not a legalistic approach. The reality is we do not know what to do. When we become a Christian, we immediately are taken out of our element. And God has given us guiding light so we can function and live in a way that pleases him. Even if you are a Jonah today running away from the Lord, you should do what God bids you. Do not forsake, do not observe lying vanities. If you do, you're going to forsake your own mercy. He calls for a return. Salvation is of the Lord. It's his business. Pay what you have vowed. What he bids us, according to the word of the Lord. So Jonah, as he sets out, is going to, as, as much as humanly possible within him, is go in obedience to God. You know, some of the Christian life is not rocket science. It can be childlike faith, childlike obedience, and God begins to add to our wisdom, our understanding, our ability to obey, just like a child that, that you may raise up. Fourthly, a determined ministry. Jonah had a determined ministry mm -hmm. at this point. And again, I hope that phrase is familiar to you because it's one of our biblical means as a church of how we can accomplish our spiritual goals. Our spiritual goals glorify God, the sanctification of the saints, the salvation of the lost. But how do we do that? Well, as a body, not as elders, but as a body, all of us accomplish those through a spiritual ministry, 
a balanced ministry, a Christ-centered ministry, a praying ministry, a discerning ministry, and a determined ministry. Jonah was determined to go to Nineveh. And this is a big deal. Some commentators think that Jonah was, the whale spit him up on the shore of Nineveh and he walked right in smelling like a big fish. All you have to do is look on a map and you see that, that the, uh, Nineveh is about 350 miles inland of the ocean, or Mediterranean Sea. So it wasn't that way. If, if, Jonah spit, if Jonah was spit out at Joppa, he had to travel the 50 or 60 miles back to Jerusalem, and then he had to travel the 1,000 miles up to Nineveh. But, but Jonah was determined to get there and do what he was supposed to do. When we as a church, CBC, say we, we should be a determined ministry, it's, it's with the acknowledgement that the Bible talks about us having to be determined because there are things against us. And so we are stirred up to, as we heard partially in the, in the first hour today, repent and do the first works and hold fast and not be lukewarm and, and watching unto prayer and patience and strengthening the weak knees and lifting up the hands that hang down. In other words, it, you have to expend human effort. You have to work because God is working in you. Human effort will be blessed by God because God divinely reveals to us what he wants us to do in this life. It doesn't come by osmosis. It doesn't come by us by just sitting by the side and waiting for God to strike us with lightning. Jonah, at this, in this snapshot, had a determined ministry to do what God said. And that meant a lot of things for Jonah this travel. And again, the book of Jonah is about God. It's not about Jonah. So, so there's nothing in, the, in here about Jonah's travel plans and his hardships to get there. Jonah did not, God did not disqualify Jonah from this ministry. So Jonah didn't disqualify himself. Jonah's bad attitude, his wrong motives, his stumblings, his, his terrible sin, all of that notwithstanding, Jonah went. Jonah was determined. Jonah went in faith, knowing God would give him the words to say. And we should have a determined ministry, church-wide, personally-wise. A determined ministry does not take into account our feelings and our emotions. Mm. It does not take into account our personal wants and desires our comfort. It doesn't even take into account what others think. I believe Jonah did not care what the Ninevites were going to think or what even the Israelites thought about him going into the enemy's camp to preach the word. He was determined to be obedient to his master. It's really quite simple when we, when we say that. He was determined to be obedient and trust God to help him. And again, I think this biblical reminder, as we've termed it, or we've coined the phrase, a determined ministry, we, God knows we need this reminder, this reprimand, this encouragement to be about our Father's business because in Adam's race, we all suffer those things that are contrary to being determined. Laziness, mm. slothfulness, distraction. Selfishness. I, I just got to have a little bit of time for myself, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a week off. All these things, ge theological justifications. I think Jonah had a theological justification. He put his construct on what he took, thought of God and what he thought of culture. So he responded out of his own mind. Again, in this snapshot, I think he had a determined ministry. From Jonah chapter 1 and verse 1 to the last verse of chapter 4, God had a determined ministry. God has a determined ministry. Should not we? No matter what Jonah did, Jonah, you know, he was reluctant, he was hard-headed, he was disobedient, he did this, that, and the other thing, running 3,000 miles away, everything that went into Jonah's life, all through that thread, God's purpose never changed. God's word remained everlasting and eternal. 
God was not moved away a millionth of an inch because Jonah's acting like a spiritual knucklehead. God meant what he said, and God would fulfill his purpose. And Jonah should have taken into account the abiding word of God and God's providences and God's decree and God's ultimate goal for his own glory. I think really when we got, if we could get below the surface and had a little bit more information, we would see Jonah was really determined at this point. And I think he was determined for good motives. He wanted to obey and he was determined for bad motives. He was trying to avoid repentance, avoid chastening. Because that's really hard if, if to do it biblically, to do it rightly. Mm -hmm. And to very, very narrowly think about this for a minute by way of application, you should have a determined ministry to yourself. Amen. You should be determined I would have a determined ministry to myself. I'm going to be in God's word. I'm going to be keeping short accounts. I'm going to be praying. I'm going to be trying to learn how to pray better and for longer. I just don't want to be static in prayer to assuage my conscience. I, I want to kind of like dive into it to, to understand what prayer is really all about. You should have a determined ministry to yourself. Remember I said Jonah Jonah had to be reconciled on two fronts, his, his personal relationship with God and his public relationship to, to, to what God wanted him to do. Well, he couldn't do the public until the private was taken care of. And so maybe as a, as a church, body-wide, we can't have a determined ministry until each one of us has a determined ministry to ourselves to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Amen. You've heard the saying, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. <laughs> right? So it is in a spiritual life. You know, I don't have to do a single thing to my lawn out front of my house to have weeds grow up. Now, if I weed and feed it, and I water it correctly, and I try to take care of it, I'm still going to have weeds. But there's going to be a whole lot less few weeds. And they're going to be a whole lot easier to deal with. Jonah had a determined ministry. Lastly, mm -hmm. discriminating preaching. Discriminating preaching. And again, I'm not gonna, we're not going to get into the substance of the preaching until next time. I want to talk just for a minute about the vehicle. The idea of, of, of preaching. The idea of, of just preaching. And preaching should be discriminating and and I'm using the word discriminating as a verb that means to separate to separate the separation has many levels Jonah was going to have to show the Ninevites that there was a separation between them and God it was going to be a type of preaching that would discriminate between them and God like today where God is kind of brought down and people are kind of brought up and it's, yeah, there's something between you and the Lord, but you know, it's not as different as, as you may think. Jonah was going to have to go in and say, there is a separation. He was going to have to discriminate between fallen man and a holy God. He was going to have to get them to understand a discrimination, a separation. They were going to have to, Ninevites were going to have to separate themselves from themselves. New creation, old creation. The preaching itself was going to have to be discriminating. It was going to have to be separate from a lecture or a cajoling or a nicety or a talk. It was going to have to be preaching that would go to the heart and the mind at the exact same time and under the Spirit of God take out a heart of stone and put in a heart of flesh. Preaching is so difficult that it could never be done with human power. It has to be done with the power of God. And on, on behalf of Pastor Joe, myself for sure, we so covet prayers anytime we have to preach, anytime we spend a week in the study. I go through tremendous wrestlings with my conscience, with, with, with the Word, with God, it's it's a it's a it's a strange realm 
to be in, if I could use the word realm. We have to stand here totally erasing ourselves from ourself and trying to bring some breadcrumbs from heaven and just, just hope against hope that God will bless it to somebody here or there. Amen. It's, I mean, it's, it's God's truth. It's light that reveals things as they ought to be revealed. It, it's motive, God's motive for presenting this passage or that passage. It, it's dunamis, right? It's the power of God. If I handle a, an, an outlet, as kids, remember you used to put those little aluminum foil forks in there and you'd get sparks out? If I put a wire in there, I'll kill myself. Well, this power is nothing compared to the power of God. How do we handle the power of God? Truth is comfort. I mean, there is eternal rest for the soul here. There is joy unspeakable and full of glory. And not only that, but, but Jonah is going to, because he became a sign to the Ninevites, Jonah's going to add that, that personal element. And, and he's going to become this, this living epistle. This, this truth is, is comfort. It, it's all those things that the Word of God says it's going to be. And it has to be discriminating. It has to be different. It has to be God-blessed and God-owned. As I said, it has to go to the heart and the mind simultaneously. Christ, when he preached, he had an awareness, he had a sensitivity to the, to the folks he was preaching to. But that awareness, that sensitivity, that love did not alter the Word of God in its substance as it was preached. We may seem, when you listen to Pastor Joe's uh, uh, message during the prayer meeting, that might have seemed really harsh to you. It might have seemed very cutting edge. He's getting into my business. But that's what the Word of God asks us to do. We, we are totally sensitive to the congregation's thoughts and emotions. But, but we can't craft God's Word to fit everyone's emotions or sensitivities. Because remember, your emotions were hurt at the fall. Your emotions are not an accurate measurement of reality. Neither are mine. Neither is your intellect. Sometimes the gospel, sometimes the word of God hurts. It hurts our pride. It is, it is called the offense of the cross. Evangelistically, we're called to, to choose. Who are you going to serve? It's very discriminating. Serve the gods on the other side of the flood or serve Jehovah God. We're, we're starting to embark on this on Wednesday evenings and I think woven into the, to Pastor Joe's sermon on John, on John, fellowship with God in such a dramatic way that it's very discriminating. It, it discriminates between our Christian life today and hopefully our Christian life tomorrow will be more spiritually deep and rich. Discriminating preaching. Please pray for, for Pastor Joe and myself that Amen. our preaching would be this type of discriminating, discriminating separating. Mm -hmm. Not, again, trust me, we, we love the congregation. We're aware of, of, of emotions and sensitivities and things that some of you brethren have gone through, past life. We're aware of all of that. And we try to take that into account, but we have to ultimately attempt under the blessing of God to bring God's word. Let me close with just a just a quick thought. If you were here for the prayer meeting, you you know that we were talking that Pastor Joe was talking about personal revival. A personal revival. And as you know, the book of Jonah, this is where we're going to go in, in chapter three. There's going to be a, a revival that just and an awakening that just has no equal. And I think these five, as we've just just seeing what's going to happen, I think we can apply these five personally to our life as we think about the revival that Pastor Joe was talking about earlier. 
Remember, Jonah was a disciplined prophet. We too have been disciplined in our life. And going forward, we can spiritually capitalize on that. I think that's what God's words <clears throat> tells us. A distinctive message. What's the message on this side of the whale experience, on this side of the cross? We have a more sure word of prophecy. We have every encouragement in God's word. The divine method. If we do it God's way, God will bless it. We have to be determined. We absolutely have to be determined. And we understand that this separation process, this, this discriminating preaching, will bring about the effect that God wants under the blessing of God. We'll stop there, and next time we're going to uh, look at the message that Jonah Preach. And we're going to look at it from what is said and also from the results. We're going to be able to make spiritual inferences as to what the message said as we look at the, the several results of what happened. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word today. <coughs> yes. What a, what, a, what, a, what a story in the life of Jonah. And, and if we could just apply 5% of it or 10% of it to our life, Lord, I, I sense it would make us a better Christian, stronger, more determined. We pray that you would mix these words with faith, Lord, that you would stir up the gift of God that is in us, that you would uh, remind us, Lord, of that, that great purpose that you have for your believers, to walk with you, to be obedient, to trust in you. Yes. And Lord, might you do a work in our own personal lives, and then in CBC, and then in the, the regions round about us for thy glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.